So good afternoon, everyone. Just now, Zen talked about cluster APIs in Kubernetes, and I am going to talk about another type of cluster, that is in database clusters. So welcome to join my talk this afternoon. I am glad to share our thoughts on how to manage database clusters without a dedicated operators. This is joint talk between Kublux and a China Mobile Cloud. As cloud computing and database technologies evolve, I think finding an efficient and cost-effective way to manage database clusters has become crucial. And I hope this presentation provides you with valuable insights and practical solutions. Before we dive into the details, let me introduce myself and my co-speaker. I'm Shenshen from Kubelux, and uh, AppCloud is a startup company behind Kubelux. Before joining AppCloud, I worked in Alibaba Database Group as a senior engineer, and uh, my daily work is for SQL optimization and SQL execution. So during the past several years, I focused more on databases rather than cloud native technologies. So this is more like uh, uh, sharing my point of view from a database person. And my co-speaker, Shen, he is a senior system architect in China Mobile Cloud. He is also Kubelux contributors. He made his first commit early this year, and he is very interested in our project. So months later, maybe like this July, um, he successfully integrated one of their in-house operators into Kubelux. And uh, in the, today's talk, he will share his stories about Kubelux, why they use Kubelux, how KB can help them reduce the workloads, and their future plans with Kubelux. Throughout the talk, we won't dive into any detailed or specific technologies in, in this talk. So the story of uh, Kubelux starts very, with a very simple idea, Let's, that is how to manage databases. Our group, I mean the group of person in AppCloud, it is a group of people with strong database technologies and uh, Kubernetes background. So it's all include persons from like database developers, administrators, all those who uh, do uh, database migrations and SIEs. And we have to deal with hundreds of cloud database issues daily. This is our work. And uh, these issues covering from like database crashes, uh, slow queries for performance, and high availabilities, and uh, resource schedulings extra. So the interesting part, I think, about our team is like we don't want to, we don't need to manage databases. We have to manage various databases. Because this is the group of people with who we are. We have to work on different database types, for instance, like MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, and MongoDB. So when one day we gather together and share our thoughts, like, or exchange our thoughts on how to manage databases better nowadays. We found that there are some things that are in common for this series of databases. These are widely used open source databases that you can, your people can touch every day. And uh, the question we have is, if we can improve management of one database, can other databases benefit from it? Is this question that we can solve or not. Besides, we noticed that databases are in an area of rapid growth. And uh, with new data products emerging continuously, and uh, this kind of new databases, to some extent, I think they still inherit some common characteristics of a database. So the challenge we face now here is, is it possible for us to design a unified platform to manage not only one, but a batch of widely used databases, and even more, we want to manage those emerging databases as well. So this is the question we have at the very first period. If 
It is possible that we can have a such platform. We hope it can be deployed on various infrastructures. It means either on cloud, on in-premise infrastructures, and we conduct Kubernetes. I think that is the choice we have, because Kubernetes stands as the de facto standard of container orchestration, and I think it can bring the platform to like a public cloud, private cloud, a dedicated cloud, or edge cloud. So we want to solve the question or challenge as how to manage those various databases on Kubernetes. Those various here at the very beginning includes MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, and MongoDB, because this is a group uh, this is the uh, kind of databases that we are familiar with, and uh, we have a lot of experiences on these kind of things. So to solve it on um, Kubernetes, obviously the answer is we need an operator. So we won't go to uh, any details of how to design an operator here today. And uh, I know that there are uh, like battles, argues on how to run or not to run databases on Kubernetes. That is not a topic that we want to cover today. So the thing we have to answer is how to manage various databases here. So let's take a look at what means manage. Manage in database, I think uh, it usually refers to uh, several typical like tasks like provisioning, how to do scaling, like either horizontally or vertically, or we can do like have to do backups and restore, and uh, to do configurations, especially for parameters, because database parameters are crucial for like performance tuning. And uh, besides, we have to do like a mic minor version upgrading, to do volume expansion, to do monitoring. And this is a series of tasks every dedicated operator have to solve. If like you, you want to solve this kind of question using a dedicated operator, and you need a team, at least uh, consists of two types of persons. One is like database experts. He knows how to manage the database. And uh, you need another team for cloud native experts to build the operator. He knows the Kubernetes well. He knows cloud well. But besides these um, people, like the, the invest, you have to invest a lot of times. For example, you have to wait for six or uh, six months or, or one year, the time uh, you have to invest into the team, a lot of users that who can use the operator to help you to, re to uh, refine the operator. The more the user, I think the better the operator. But this is quite a challenge, because I don't think that every database team can afford all these kind of things. The people, the time, the user. So we, we observed that operators are delivered in different maturity levels, and that is the reality we face. So compared to Kubernetes, to me, because I am more like a database person, I think CM database is a relatively niche field with few experts, because you can, because um, few people like are working on it, and you have to gain a lot of experience during maybe uh, during the past decades, and you have to solve a lot of issues you face. That makes your database, uh, database expert. So we, the question to me that I want to solve first is, can we find a way to rapidly transform database experts' knowledge into productivity? Because they are high, high, uh, hard to find. To transform their knowledge, I think it means that we can translate it into code, either in YAML code or Go language code, so that more and more databases, I think, they can run on Kubernetes easily, and they are willing to run it on Kubernetes. That will, I think, increase their popularity of databases. So is that possible? Let's take uh, a traditional uh, task. For example, so let's recap what we do for backup and recover. So every database, I think, needs backup recover for the 
it is quite crucial for disaster recovery. So traditionally, we have to, uh, a list of things to do. First, you have to design some backup methods, and either it's regular for backups or continuous archive logs for point-in-time recovery, and you need a backup scheduler to trigger the tasks hourly, daily, weekly, or at user specified scale. Then you have to put the backup files into some place. We call it a backup repository. The repository can be a local PV or some object storage, either S3 on AWS, OSS, uh, or main I.O. in your test environment. This people traditionally do for backup restore. And the last thing you do is you want to recover a new database from the backup. So you have to construct a lot, uh, a set of restore scripts, and it, you have to decide whether to restore the data before or after the pod is running. That is the general procedure people do to do backup and recover. But by analyzing the whole procedure, we found an interesting thing. That is, what a database person can do here and uh, what he cannot do. He can focus, what he can do is quite limited and focused. He can choose uh, database specific backup tools, one or several, uh, which, whichever he is more familiar with, write some scripts, and uh, he may use a command to start a continuous archive logs. That is he familiar with. And the, next, the, the third thing he can do is to restore data. What a script he's, he needs to restore data. And the last and the other things listed here, I think, can be left to a cloud native experts. He can construct a platform, ask an expert to fill the three lines. Either it is works for different experts or for the same experts that he wants to adapt it to different database versions. So the work of the two kind of experts are quite clean, and that is give us the confidence that there could be a chance that we can construct a platform. We make it run, and it is good for a database person to fit in, to fit their knowledge, and convert it into code with few lines. So that is the story that behind KubeLux and why we decided to make such a project. So KubeLux is open source last year. I think more accurate, to be more accurate, it is like last June, and has over 2,000 stars till today. It is totally open source and cloud neutral. So to me, my understanding of KubeLux, it is like, it is more like a database operator framework designed with like database domain knowledges. So in another word, I think it is like, it is a database type agnostic operator. And its special feature is it is extensible, flexible, and pluggable. These are the three key features that I think I want to convey. To be extensible, we provide a unified APIs. And based on these APIs, we provide an add-on mechanism for integrating in uh, engines. Engine here means a database. So that is how uh, China Mobile Cloud can easily fit their in house database engine into cable blocks. I think uh, they spend maybe uh, less than one, one month with just one person. And uh, flexible means it is very flexible in topology. Users can custom and can pause any cluster topologies for their specific needs. And uh, they can pick components from our add-on market. We have add-on mechanisms, and we have an independent repository called uh, CubeLock add-ons, with, I guess, so far, with more than 40 add-ons in the repository, and uh, most of them are contributed by the community for their own needs. So you will see that uh, many engines that, may, you, that, that you may have not seen anywhere else, or they don't, you cannot find an operator for, for most of them. Or let, I mean like a dedicated operator for most of them. 
And the plugable, it is uh, thanks for to our modular design. You can use back all, all these modules like this here are uh, pluggable, like uh, backup restore, monitoring, configurations. So you can pick which model to use or not, up to your own requirement. So, and this is the QR code for our project, GitHub project. So if you are interested in our project, you can scan the QR code to get more, I think, technological details, documentations, and you will find a full list of the Kubelux add-ons. Of course, add-ons like are also delivered at a different maturity levels. To, to make all these features, I mean the flexibility, extensibility, and the pluggable um, features into true, we need a concise modeling of database in three steps. The first step is we provide a full layer modeling of databases. It is like first, we refer to each individual database system or service as a component, as I list here. We can refer to MySQL as a component, and it provides MySQL services, or orchestrator as an independent component, because it provides MySQL high availability services. And uh, they together forms a cluster. So I think, uh, to be more accurate, cluster it is, uh, can be called as a collection of components. They work together to handle a database task. For example, you, you pick one MySQL component and one orchestrator component, then you have a cluster, you have a MySQL cluster that is high availability. Of course, you can add another component for proxy, any, any proxy component that you've preferred. So that is the flexibility of the cluster. But so far, we did not see anything special. What is so special about the database? Database, it is more than a stateful workload. I think the mo most special part, in my understanding, is it has rows. Rows means it, usually we will see that a primary a secondary cluster or a ETCD cluster with like leaders, followers, learners, these roles are crucial to database management. So we proposed a new kind of enhanced workload called the instance set. It is a role aware workload. And it is an enhancement of existing stateful set in Kubernetes. It manages instance in specific row order, not in ascending or descending numeric orders. Besides, it provides like heterogeneous uh, replica management or take a, a specific instances offline or online. I think that is a quite special, unique part in Kubernetes, in, in Kubelux. And uh, there will be another talk the day after tomorrow. And uh, my colleague, Xie Chang, will, will introduce more details of instance set. So I will not touch too much uh, about it. And uh, the next modeling, now this is a four layer modeling, right? The next thing we find is for database users, it is too complicated for them to touch all these kind of things. So we disaggregate each layer for different users. For example, for database expert who we who knows the, the who has more uh, database knowledge, they will touch with class definition to different topology uh, for provisioning orders, and they will touch with component de definition to define this engine specific behaviors and provide what is the images they need, the services they need, and the compatibilities between these uh, service versions. So this kind of information are quite sophisticated, but relatively stable. And for database users, they only touch with what kind of component they use to consist a cluster and uh, the resources they use in the component. For example, the CPU memory, uh, disk size and the replica of each component. 
So this kind of disaggregation makes things much easier for database users. And they can have a unified API to interact with different kind of components in the clusters. That is paved the, the, uh, the learning curve for most of them. So that's why most, uh, um, I think my, uh, most of, of uh, people in the community like, like our project. So this is the step two that we do the modeling. Here, uh, with more and more add-ons integrated into our project, we find uh, that set up script is not enough from define what engine specific behaviors. There are more behaviors we have to deal with. It is not just the setup script, the booting, strap, booting script. So what's, what's next? That is, uh, we, uh, we call it a database interface. You have to design a well, uh, we need a well-defined database interfaces. Or in Kubelux, we call it lifecycle actions to manage this kind of things to manage replicas, components. That is quite special in database. So they are up to eight lifecycle actions, different actions we, uh, we have so far. I think that with more and more add-ons or different databases integrated into our community, then we'll, the, the number of actions will increase such as reconfiguration, uh, account, uh, account provisioning, etc. So for these eight actions, I put them, I categorize them into three groups. The first group is for role-based management. Remember that role is crucial to database. And the second is we have what we have to do to perform horizontal scaling in or out. And the, the third part is about component level uh, actions we perform, like when a component starts or, compon or to, to uh, invoke it when a, uh, when a component uh, stops. And the most widely used action is a row prob action here. So what a row prob do? We know that these actions, the detail of each of the actions dif uh, differs from database to database. But, but what row prob do, it's target quite clean. It is triggered periodically to check a row of each replica and it will report a row to the pod, either by events or by some API calls. So each pod or replica knows its uh, rows and the services can be routed to the expected part, and we can manage the, these replicas by their rows as expected. So this is uh, the kind of action that used widely in many databases, and we provide a customer handler for each of them, and uh, makes it makes uh, almost all databases easily to fit into our model with, without writing any line of Golang language. So that is uh, key design concepts of Kubelast we have. We have a four-layered four -layered, uh, abstraction of databases. We disaggregated the layers for different users and we proposed a database interface to manage the lifecycle actions of, their, of databases. So to sum up, it is Kubelux. It is more like a database agnostic operator. It has add-on APIs for those who develop add-ons, so you can easily design your own add-on like MySQL, MongoDB, PostgreSQL, and Redis as an add-on in integrated into Kubelux. So any change of the add-on can be made with a slight change of code. You don't, have to you don't have to recompile the whole project. And the other set of API is our four-layered uh, abstraction of the cluster. And uh, people, like, like end users or database users, yet in, they can interact with the APIs to manage different kind of, of clusters they have either using a command line or API, REST APIs, extra. 
So to conclude, I think KubeLux it to supports various databases and uh, it provides a unified APIs for clusters and uh, provides a database interface to life, for lifecycle actions. I think with more databases integrated, these actions will be uh, fine-tuned as well. And uh, I guess within uh, two or three months, KubeLux version 1.2 Zero will be released, and uh, it will have more enhanced features with uh, to support shardings, uh, to support reconfiguration, or with better reconfigurations, and uh, we support more actions, as we define, as we said previously. So this is a QR code again for our GitHub project, and uh, you are welcome to join our community and check out the list of cube blocks, we, uh, the the cube blocks add-ons we have so far. And uh, you are welcome to leave any message in our community. And uh, thanks for listening. And uh, that's uh, the share uh, today. And, uh, and uh, my co-speaker, Shen, cannot make the presentation in person. So he made a, a video yesterday. So now let's check out what his story about Kubelux between uh, Kubelux and uh, China Mobile Cloud. And uh, we'll check. And what is their next plan on Cuba blocks? Just a minute. Writing dedicated operators. So let's start. Before we jump in, let me first introduce to you an overview on the China Mobile Cloud Debus product line. We have a comprehensive product line ranging from transactional databases, analytical and search databases, NoSQL, etc. Not only do we provide open source and third party DB services, we are also developing our own in house DB engines and we want to provide DB services on top of that. Currently, we are serving more than 35,000 customers in nine key industries, such as the government, telecom, the healthcare, education, etc. And there are more than 130,000 cloud DB instances running inside our 15 level one regions and 31 level two regions. Besides the DB resource provisioning, we also provide a solid ecosystem that helps our customers managing their DB more efficiently, such as the data migration, management council, and AI ops. What's more, most of our DB instances are running inside Kubernetes clusters in a cloud native way. As you can see, Managing such a massive scale of DB instances is the challenging task. Although we built a debug system that can manage different kinds of DB instances well, we are currently facing challenges on maintaining such a debug system. Currently, our debug system is roughly divided into the API layer and the operator layer. And the operator layer is the core part. Our first challenge is that we develop different operators for different DB engines. These operators are so different that the operator developers for engine A is unable to quickly switch to developing the operator for engine B. This leads to inflexible dev resource allocation. Furthermore, it places high demands on developers. They not only need to understand the principles of DB engine itself, but also need to be familiar with the entire operator framework. Although there are some existing frameworks available, they still pose high requirements for developers. This makes it difficult to quickly add productive developers to the team. What's more, we are developing our in-house DB engines and we want to make a debug system for them quickly. However, due to the challenges mentioned earlier, we are unable to rapidly develop a debug system for the new engine. To do that, 
we need to build a highly skilled dev team that understand our DB engine and operator frameworks. Then, these developers have to write a new operator from scratch. That's because the DB engine is a fully in-house engine developed by ourselves, so we cannot find any existing operators available. Writing from scratch means that a lot of redundant work has to be done. Even if some logic is very similar in other DB engine operators, we cannot effectively reuse them. So, we are thinking of the solutions. How can we make the operators have similar interfaces? How can we lower the requirements for the bus system developers? And how can we integrate new DB engines quickly? Then we came across the Cubebox project which can solve our problems quite well. Cubebox is a universal operator framework specifically designed for database workloads. The developers write add-ons for different DB engines to be integrated into the Cubebox system. This project attracts us in several characteristics. First, it is a universal operator framework. This means there is only one operator running for all kinds of different DB engines. Developers only need to maintain a single operator and a single set of CRD. This makes it easy to share knowledges around all the developers at the operator layer. They can be assigned to different engine teams in a flexible way. Furthermore, the framework uses a low-code development model this integration of different DB engines are achieved by writing different add-ons rather than writing dedicated operators from scratch. The add-ons are just ham charts with CR objects from the Cubebox framework. When we develop add-ons, we just need to write the YAML file for the CR objects we need, as well as some functional scripts. We will cover more details on them. The CR objects in the add-on are defined in a declarative way. The developers only need to describe the expected state of a running DB cluster, just like other Kubernetes objects. And the Kubernetes framework will handle the reconciliation for it. This local development model lowers the bar for developing the debug system for a new DB engine. Developers only need to know how the DB engine works, and they are free to start. Also, less code means there will be less potential bugs, and the integration for a new DB engine is accelerated. That meets our requirements quite well. What's more, the Kubebox is a generic framework that is specifically designed for DB workloads. It effectively covers all the basic management operations for databases on Kubernetes. For example, it covers the lifecycle management, backup and restore, configuration management, high availability, etc. Additionally, Kubeblocks also includes extensible mechanisms, allowing specific DB engine management operations to seamlessly integrate into the overall framework. After a thorough research, we decided to give Cubebox a try. At that time, there is an in-house DB engine needs to be integrated into the debug system. We call it HDB as the placeholder name. This is a perfect opportunity to validate the use of Cubebox for debug system integration. Let me first have a brief introduction on our HDB. It is a fully in-house developed cloud-native distributed database engine, separating the computation and the storage layer. Usually, writing a DB operator for such a complex DB system is challenging, not mentioned to do it in a quick way. However, thanks to the Kubrox project, this time we can achieve that in a local way. Here's how we build the whole Kubrox add-on. The first step is to design the cluster topology and build up an add-on scaffold. Usually, the initial add-on just contains a rough cluster definition scaffold 
in a very basic cluster version, which specified the images for all the component containers. Back to our case, there are two components in our HDB cluster, the computer nodes and the data nodes. So we define a cluster definition object with these two components. We, config, we configure the images for each component in the cluster version and just set a dummy start command in the class definition terminal temporarily. Then we write a simple cluster CR object for test to ensure that all the add-ons can be installed without problems and the pods can be started successfully. The next step is to refine the class definition, setting the right configuration parameters in the config map, also writing the script to bootstrap the cluster. We tweak our configuration and scripts to make the cluster up and running. This is a very important step because it means the first workable add-on is done. The next big part is to support the backup and recovery capability. We need to write the functional scripts on the backup and recovery and integrate them into the action set CR objects in QBlox. We can create a backup of the request and a an restore of the request to test the functionality. Then we write the config, config constraint on the add-on to control which parameters can be modified, whether they can be dynamically reloaded or not, and the reload command. This makes the add-on able to modify some configuration parameters in the DB engine. After that, we did some more tweaks to the add-on. The next step is to enable the high availability and the road detection. As some observability sidecars in our DB clusters, which will collect the metrics and logs from DB instances. And finally, we can add more cluster versions to map different kernel versions. Now, a complete QBlox add-on for our HDB is done. By using QBlox, we finished the first debug system for HDB in just two months with just one person. And this can be even faster because the later steps for building the add-on can be parallelized. This is our first successful QBlox integration case in China Mobile Cloud. Here is a summarized comparison between developing QBlox add-ons versus developing a dedicated operator. We compare our QBlox add-on developing process with the developing process by writing dedicated operators for a similar DB engine. For developer resource invested for the QBlox add-ons costs about two person months, and for a dedicated operator it costs about six person months. For the code written, the QBlox add-on process uh, takes about 2,000 lines, and for a dedicated operator, it costs about 7,000 lines. And for the code contents for the QBlox add-ons, it mainly consists of the CR objects, YAML files, and functional scripts. And for the dedicated operator, it mainly consists of the design of the CRD, and the operator Golang code and the functional scripts. And for the requirements for developers, for developing a QBlock add-on, the developers need to know the dedicated DB engine knowledge as well as the scripting, scripting knowledge. And for developing a dedicated operator, besides the dedicated DB engine knowledge and the scripting knowledge, the developers also need to have some Golang knowledge, and they need to know the K Kubernetes operator framework, such as using the client Go and the controller runtime. The case of HDB is a great starting point. It shows that we can address the issues currently faced on the debug system by using QBlox. Our next step is to further integrate more engines through QBlox for additional evaluation and to try to upgrade to a new version of QBlox, evaluating some features we are interested in. In China Mobile Cloud, our ideal goal is to build a unified cloud-native device platform. 
On this platform, we aim to achieve unified multi-cloud architecture, unified interfaces at the API and the operator layers, supporting DB clusters for different architectures, and the DB instances can be deployed on serverless Kubernetes clusters on demand. This will form a unified database orchestration and general management platform that supports different infrastructures such as public cloud, private cloud, dedicated cloud, edge cloud, etc. As Kubebox continues to develop and improve, once it reaches sufficient maturity, we will consider restructuring our existing device engines based on the Kubebox framework. Although it may involve the initial restructuring work, in the long run, we expect to save about 15% of the development resources on different DB engines. So, that's all for my sharing on the Qbox integration case in China Mobile Cloud. Thanks for watching. And uh, thank you, thank you for all for stay so late, because the time is up. Maybe so. I think there's no time for Q and A, but I will stay here. If we ha have any questions, we can we can exchange our ideas after the the talk. And uh, my and uh, my colleagues will be here. I think till the day after tomorrow, right? So if we, if you are interested in our project, please come to us. And. Uh, you can follow us also on GitHub. Okay, so thank you.